Uh, this is the final panel of the afternoon, um, but we have cocktails afterwards. Uh, our panel uh, this afternoon looks at natural resource trends. Uh, if we had had this conference not too many years ago, I'm not sure we would have had an entire panel looking at natural resources. Um, we might well have focused on energy, uh, but I think many of us today place a considerably higher value on other types of natural resources than we did uh, not too many years ago. Some, Mike or somebody mentioned fisheries um, in the previous panel. Uh, water issues. Water issues, of course, now dominate um, uh, international affairs in much of the world. Um, certainly they are a key uh, element uh, in Asia. Frequently as a source of competition, potential conflict, um, less frequently, but sometimes as a source of cooperation. Uh, most of us had never even heard of rare earths until a couple of weeks ago. And uh, here's another uh, natural resource which is now um, uh, all of a sudden become important. Uh, we're going to focus today uh, specifically on energy, but I think it's worth just remembering that um, this is just part of a much larger set of issues that uh, we need to grapple with today in a way which uh, we didn't not too many years ago. Uh, we'll, we'll hear first, since we'll just go down the line, from David uh, Roland Holst who is a professor here at Berkeley in the Department of Agricultural and Resources Economics. Um, he has done a lot of work over the years on uh, energy, uh, climate policy modeling. His research uh, was instrumental in uh, the passage of the uh, California's Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, he holds a Ph.D. as well from Berkeley. Well, seems to be a trend here uh, on the Berkeley connection. Uh, David, we turn things over to you. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, it's hard to leave Berkeley, that's for sure. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming uh, to hear about these issues, even in a, late in a very hot day. Um, I, I understand my responsibilities as one of the closing speakers, so I'm not going to detain you too long, but I want to talk a little bit about I would say the most kind of momentous components of the story of uh, regional energy, global energy, and China's place in that. Uh, really, it's a very simple message that I want to I want to convey today. I'll apologize in advance if my remarks are less than seamless because I didn't learn until I walked in today that we were in a PowerPoint-free zone. <laughs> so I had to rewrite my entire presentation while I was listening to a very stimulating uh, presentation in the previous session. But I'll do my best to keep it, to hold it together. I can't show you some exciting and rather scary slides, though, so if, maybe they'll be posted later on the, uh, on the web. But in any case, uh, China, as we all know, is a very effective international competitor. But uh, I would say certainly the general public may be less aware that China is a very resource-constrained economy. In fact, there are only two abundant resources in the country. One is labor and the other is coal. Coal, which carries with it a very significant carbon liability, and that in itself will be a constraint going forward. Uh, the fact is that recent growth rates that China has enjoyed, uh, even for two decades, cannot be sustained on current patterns of resource use. And what this portends is some combination of increasing efficiency, import dependence, and or attenuated growth. So China is facing some very serious decisions about how to sustain its growth and, to sus and the political sustainability that uh, it, that growth has conferred upon decision makers in an environment which is going to be increasingly challenging. And I'm going to give you some very general perspectives on this, and then if we have time, I'll come back to specifics, um, uh, although it's a very short presentation today. But energy consumption growth in China has been extremely dramatic over the last 20 years. I think most of you are aware of that. From a relatively unknown player in global energy markets, China is now either the world's first or second, depending on whether you believe the IEA, the International Energy Agency, or the NBS, the National Bureau of Statistics in China, the largest energy consumer in the world. And by acclamation of international agencies and even the, the Chinese government, China is the world's largest emitter of CO2. 
energy and CO2 are basically synonymous, at least conventional energy and CO2. So that's, uh, th those two titles came along at about the same time for China about a year ago. In addition, China is now exerts a very significant influence on world oil and coal markets. It's a major player in renewable technologies. I think everybody's seen the stories about uh, very rapid investments in uh, renewables. I and many of you may have had the pleasure of sitting on trains uh, in Western China and seeing mile after mile of windmills, many of which are not even connected to uh, transmission infrastructure. But there's a lot going on at the margin in China, but I assure you it's a trivial contribution to total energy in China right now. It really isn't enough to make a difference yet. Uh, China is going to exert more influence on world national, natural gas markets, and that's why, uh, as a Vietnamese vice minister said at a presentation I attended in Hanoi, if I look at a map of China, I get the impression if I went swimming with my family and uh, on the beach in Da Nang, I'd be violating China's territorial integrity. <laughs> <laughs> Because there are many large contentious regions with natural gas reserves in the South China Sea and other places. And we're seeing uh, emergent controversies, uh, which really portend uh, increased competition for energy in that region. Also uranium. Uh, China is a, a very, becoming a very significant player in uranium markets. As you know, the N-word, nuclear energy has come back into polite conversation these days because the bottom line is it's not a carbon technology. And so we can expect to hear a lot more about nuclear power. And the Chinese are very pragmatic about deploying that, uh, that type of energy. But simply put, the current pace of energy demand in China is not sustainable. At current levels of energy intensity, if China's economy continued at only 7%, which is relatively modest by the last two decades standards <clears throat> over the next two years, then uh, by 2030, China would have absorbed 60% of the growth of primary energy supply. And it's very hard to see how one country could do that, could outbid uh, so many other players in global energy markets for new energy. Uh, it's very hard to do the math, shall we say, on China's current growth rates, its current energy intensity, and the anticipated availability of, uh, of conventional energy resources. On the other hand, the Chinese economy has to keep going. We all know that for political reasons and other reasons. And Chinese per capita income is only 15% of US per capita income. So the headroom there is very substantial. <laughs> And expectations are commensurate with that, certainly in Chinese urban areas. And if I have time for more detailed comments, I'll tell you about how that kind of economic transition, rising incomes, changes the entire energy economy in a country. But the only way to maintain growth and, uh, and lower energy demand, uh, to meet uh, the growth objectives within the envelope of uh, reasonable expectations about global energy resources, is going to be to lower energy intensity. And that means improving efficiency on a really a relatively unprecedented scale. There's plenty of room for this in China. That's the good news. China has plenty of potential for energy efficiency improvements. Current energy intensity of Chinese GDP is about two and a half times the global average. And it's four times uh, the OECD average. So there really are many opportunities. How could this happen in a more most fundamental way? Let me just try to give it to you from a, a macro, uh, sort of intuitive macro perspective. The most effective way for China to reduce its energy intensity is to undergo the structural transition, which is being discussed in many different, from many different dimensions. But the fundamental transition is to rotate the Chinese economy away from export dependence, dependence on external demand, towards a newly emergent post-industrial middle class economy. This would be driven by rising incomes and an appreciating currency. I know this is going on video, but I have to say that, okay? Uh, those, are the, those two drivers will allow China to expand its domestic economy in a way that's driven by increased purchasing power and essentially a rotation towards a post-industrial economic structure. A big part of energy's, uh, China's energy problem would be solved by this because the problem right now is that it, the economy is so energy intensive. Industry and GDP is about 47% in real terms in China. That's double the figure in the United States. All the OECD economies, I'm sorry, you know, we are post-industrial economies. We get two-thirds of our GDP and employment in the high-income countries from giving each other haircuts and espresso drinks, right? <laughs> I'm not sure. Services, tertiary sector, two-thirds of GDP, two-thirds of employment. 
and about 25% is industry, the rest is agriculture. In China, 47% of the economy is still focused on industrialization. And the major reason for this is because of post-WTO export dependence. Our own estimates suggest that foreigners are consuming as much energy in China through demand for exports as Chinese households themselves. Because export production is so much more energy intensive than domestic consumption. So China hasn't just become the workshop of the world, it's become the smokestack of the world. It has become the power plant of the world. And the embodied energy in those exports has essentially outsourced fossil fuel consumption from the OECD economies. It well, outsourced maybe jobs, but it's also outsourced pollution services. It's also outsourced energy use. And China's economy itself has been seriously distorted for a long time, China's economy was essentially decoupling. It was becoming more and more energy efficient with the advent of new technologies, new technology adoption. But when China joined the WTO, suddenly the curve began to reverse itself. And China was essentially reindustrializing along more traditional lines. Along with the demand of foreign sources came a boom in the old fashioned energy intensive patterns of infrastructure development, construction heavy grade steel production and cement. Very energy intensive, very pollution intensive. Everybody likes houses and some people like to own eight apartments in China, you know? I mean, everybody's very happy about the boom in infrastructure, but this has created a real challenge. And in fact, right now, there's a, there's a controversy you've probably heard about in China among more what I would call liberal economists that the stimulus package, which, which began in 2007, really went back to the old school approach to investment. Heavy public investment in the old infrastructure, the old patterns of spending, because they wanted quick, shovel-ready projects. But essentially, that also intensified China's energy consumption and emissions. So that, this is a problem. The external dependence and the focus on infrastructure and, uh, and uh, uh, heavy investment. Investment and exports really are driving them tremendous element of, uh, of energy and, um, and emissions. Because the service sector, healthcare, haircuts, and espresso drinks is much less energy intensive, the transition to a more consumption-based economy could significantly reduce China's future energy requirements. This could really make the biggest contribution. Uh, technology will help a lot. Uh, China's adopting uh, first world technologies in many sectors uh, in terms of energy efficiency. But the rotation, the structural rotation of the economy will make a much larger contribution as that uh, happens. But this suggests that China's transition to a more consumption-based economy is not just a trade policy issue, like you hear uh, Washington and Beijing con constantly batting the renminbi back and forth. It's much more than just a trade issue. The transition of China towards uh, developing its domestic market and moving away from export dependence towards domestic demand is actually a very fundamental global environmental issue and a fundamental energy issue. So from a, global pro and from a global climate perspective, looking at the rate at which China is contributing both to energy demand and to emissions, it may be the issue. And we all know, I think, uh, that Copenhagen just really it wasn't the right time to stage Copenhagen for this some fundamental reason. China has other priorities right now. They have to create 30 million jobs a year. And this particular pattern of industrialization and development is the way that they do it. So it's very hard right now to get a north-south dialogue going. But if China can begin this rotation, it'll be easier and easier to find commonality and hopefully some cooperation in terms of technology transfer. Those are sort of the fundamentals of the story. But I'll tell you a little bit about details. I think I've got a few minutes left. Uh, just uh, get into these drivers a little more deeply. The fundamental drivers for the growth of energy demand and uh, sort of China's really enormous momentum in this area are rising incomes, industrialization, and the export orientation, as I've already said. So from a fundamental perspective, let's think about that a little bit. Energy and affluence essentially go together. It's sad but true. I mean, maybe it's sad in a way, but this is a problem. If you graph incomes per capita around the world and energy use per capita, they just keep going. Consumption patterns become more energy intensive with rising incomes. And there are certain sentinel commodities that sort of lead the way. Uh, for example, an example, a classic example is automobiles. Automobiles I refer to as a sentinel commodity because they represent an entire way of living, an entire lifestyle, which changes 
a whole constellation of consumption patterns. And generally, those are all going to be more energy intensive. So if you look at automobile demand, it can be a little bit unnerving. In the United States, we have 800 cars per 1,000 people. Japan, about 650. I was surprised. I thought Japan would be much lower. But about 800 cars per capita, per 1,000 people, sorry, in the United States. China, does anybody know the number for China? 32. It was 20 recently, but 32. Now, China may not reach half of the United States level of car consumption per capita, but even if it did, that would be a meteoric increase in global vehicle stocks, because you're talking about four times the population. So the real question is, how can we go forward from this? Some of my Enviro friends have said, well, don't worry, the Chinese will make their cars out of carbon fiber and lots of cool stuff like that. You know, I drive an Audi. <laughs> and the reason I drive an Audi is because I really like the Audis I was riding around in, in China. And, you know, the official car, Audi 6, going, you know, that's what the government uses. They're made out of the same steel and rubber and stuff as my Audi is. So, no, I don't think it's going to quite play out that way. But there's no question that the growth of demand is essentially inexorable. As incomes rise, Chinese will want the same things. And this, and another, this is another aspect of the dysfunction of Copenhagen. We can't deny people the same material aspirations we've already achieved for ourselves. And in fact, when it comes to uh, climate mitigation, just mitigation, not an adaptation, which is going to be the big one coming later, but mitigation. I heard a Chinese vice minister say right into a microphone, he said, let me make sure I understand this. You want us to pay for the sins of your grandfathers. Have I got that right? And of course, he does have it right, because three quarters of the global stock of CO2 was laid down before 1950, when China's per capita income was $2 a year. It was laid down as a result of the Industrial Revolution, which gave, conferred the living standards that we all enjoy on the West, and the Chinese are very well aware of that. So this legacy issue has to be addressed, or we won't overcome that dysfunctional dialogue. But affluence is something that clearly the Chinese are determined to proceed with, and you can it's obvious politically why they want to do that, but it has consequences. I, I won't talk about agriculture today. I've got another talk about agriculture that tells a very similar story because the resource intensity of agriculture does the same thing. As the incomes rise, the diet shifts towards meat. Meat is a very inefficient source of protein. I like it, but it requires multiples of the, of the agricultural resources that vegetable protein does. So anyway, these ills of affluence, if you want to call it that, in terms of resource intensity, we have to contend with. We know income is rising in China faster in the cities than in the rural areas, but it's rising. And with it is the energy intensity of, of lifestyles and consumption. Also migration for, to urban areas. Urbanites consume two to four times as much energy as rural dwellers, simply because of all the infrastructure around them the, both the domestic infrastructure in their homes, like air conditioners, and also the basic, uh, the basic uh, public goods that are delivered to them. And as we move forward through the vehicle story, policy can be promoting efficiency. It can be discouraging efficiency. Why do we have so many cars in the United States? People like to drive, right? We also have so many cars because the government gives transportation the largest subsidies of any industry in the United States. Most people think farmers are the biggest uh, beneficiaries of government subsidies. It's not true. It's transportation. And how does it come? Through road building. Road building is a massive subsidy to the transportation sector. And right now, the rates of road building, as you know, in China and uh, other parts of East Asia, exceed the golden age of the United States interstates of the 50s and 60s. The Chinese are building roads much faster than we did at that time. And all of that is essentially subsidizing energy intensive transport and extensive residential systems and energy intensive transport systems. And I'm really, I don't want to be pejorative about any of this. I'm not you know, a, green, a tree hugger or a, a hardcore enviro, but we have to accept the implications <coughs> of this policy facilitation. Policies right now are going in the opposite direction. They're really promoting more energy intensive. Uh, living standards, except maybe for uh, subsidies to uh, renewables. But the challenges are enormous. China, as I said, is going to consume, if it goes at, this, at the current rate, it'll consume 60% of the growth of energy supplies over the next 20 years. But those will also be very carbon intensive energy supplies. Let's take one example. I don't have much time left, but I'll give you one very concrete example. Electric power. 
China tripled its electric power supplies from 1990 to 2005. It's going to triple them again between 2005 and 2020. The increment from 2005 to 2020 will be larger than the entire install capacity of the European 25. That will be added to global electricity production. 70% of it will be coal-fired. And those technologies are 20-year investments. They're very lumpy, as we say in economics. It's really hard to reverse those decisions. So we're putting infrastructure in place, which will more than double. I mean, it's, it's, it'll, it's larger than the entire European system, basically, at the margin. The increment will be huge. So how do we move forward from this? China has basically gone from being a small net exporter of oil, believe it or not, 15 years ago, China was a small net exporter of oil, to being the world's second largest importer. This is being driven by uh, demand growth, just pure demand growth, by, by envir environmental commitments. China is trying to change the mix of its fuels, particularly towards natural gas, in order to reduce its total carbon liability. But that is increasing its import dependence. And finally, foreign exchange. China is getting richer in currency terms. I mean, the renminbi is, is slow to appreciate. But if the renminbi appreciates it substantially, look out. I've told this to my friends at Treasury. I've said, be careful what you wish for. Because if you discount oil, oil is denominated in dollars. If you discount oil by 20% for the Chinese economy, you'll see prices that you've never seen before. Right? So we've, we're in for some relatively momentous uh, forces. I mean, we're going to see momentous forces at work in this transition. And it'll be very interesting to see how Chinese policymakers address these challenges. Thank you. David, I think the technical description of your presentation was it was a real downer. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, you're lucky I didn't have the slides. They're even more scary. <laughs> uh, we'll hear now from Sahun An. Uh, Sahun, I think, takes the prize as, have, as, as the speaker and perhaps as the participant who came the furthest uh, for this conference um, since he teaches international relations um, at the University of Seoul. Um, he has done considerable amount of work in energy security, energy diplomacy, particularly involving Russia and Northeast Asia, uh, as well as regional economic security issues between um, the, the Northeast Asia and, and the former Soviet Union. He holds a PhD from London School of Economics and Political Science. So, huh? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, well, thank you very much indeed for your uh, kind introduction. Yeah, first of all, I'd, I'd like to make a sincere thanks to uh, the MBR, Michael Wills, and the Asia Foundation, also Woodrow Wills Center, and also the Institute of East Asian Studies for inviting me at the wonderful uh, event. I have a confession to make. Uh, I have no affiliation with Berkeley, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, I was trained in Georgetown and also in the UK, but uh, also, this is my first trip to the West Coast, but I feel very privileged and honored to be here. The topic that I'm going to talk about today is the progress, problems, and prospects of the energy cooperation in Northeast Asia. The energy issues are becoming a part of a security agenda in international relations because energy plays an important role in economic development and also national security. Also, there is a high probability that the Northeast Asia uh, the energy great game will take place in the next decades in Northeast Asia. And the main player in this great game will be Russia, not the US. In other words, Russia's abundant the oil and gas resources in Eastern Siberia and the Russian Far East have the potential to contribute to enhancing its bilateral and multilateral energy security relationship with neighboring states. The Russia's oil and gas have also the potential to enhance regional security more broadly because it is based on a long-term vision of energy security interests and also economic efficiency. For Northeast Asia, the Russian oil and gas also provide enormous opportunity to solve their energy shortage problems and thus diversify their existing energy markets. And Russian energy is more attractive 
particularly considering the two geopolitical factors, the current instability in Iran and Iraq, and also China's rising demand for oil and gas for its fast-growing industries. Russian oil and gas pipeline projects also have the potential to contribute to strengthening its own national interest with its enormous energy production and also export potential. Russia has an economic interest in expanding its energy markets in the Asia Pacific region. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russia has wanted to become a pivotal regional player in Asia. The Russian President Medvedev and Putin clearly hoped to upgrade Russia's prestige and influence in Northeast Asia. But nevertheless, Russia has often been portrayed in North America, Northeast Asia as a waning political and economic force since the end of the Cold War. In other words, the Russia's financial crisis during the 1998, the collapse of the Soviet Union, corruption, also the mafia phenomenon, also its incapability to pay the national debt to Korea, for example, have all deteriorated the Russia's image among Northeast Asians for the past 20 years. However, the Russia simply cannot be ignored in the new geopolitics of energy these days. The energy issue is also gradually replacing the previous ideological uh, confrontation that was a characteristic of the Cold War in the formation of a new security paradigm in the Asia Pacific in the long term. So, for, so as a result, for the first time, the Russia not the United States, may become a main cast in the leading role in the Northeast Asian energy security paradigm. Now I'd like to turn to the specific energy cooperation project in the region. The first one is the Sahalin. Sahalin is the world's largest untapped oil and gas reserve area. This area is considered to be the next Middle East. And someone say this is this Sahalin region is more promising than the Caspian region. It has more than the 10 large scaled projects and a number of international oil companies are already doing its business in Sahalin area. There are already several oil and gas projects making progress offshore, primarily on the northeast uh, shelf of the island. Among these, Sahalin 1 and 2 uh, have reached the field development and the production. And Sahalin 2 has just exported liquefied natural gas to South Korea since last year. And there are two things to emphasize as regard to Sahalin. The one is the most of Sahalin projects are offshore work. So Russia cannot develop uh, the project with its own capital and finance and its technology. So international oil companies must get involved in this project. And the other important thing is the Sahalin project uh, really represents a good opportunity for uh, Russia and the Gazprom to begin the learning the LNG business, the liquefied natural gas business. So for Russia, the LNG exports are considered to be the both commercially and geopolitically safer uh, than the cross-border pipelines in Northeast Asia. And the second project that I want to discuss is the Kobikta gas project. Uh, this is Russia's biggest and also hidden energy card. This is something that the most people are not familiar with, but you will see the name of this field uh, in the me news media in the next several decades uh, many times. And this is the single largest, one of the single largest gas fields uh, in the world. And the COVID gas field has proven reserves of the 2,000 billion cubic meters BCM per year, enabling production for 30 to 40 years. And Kobikta contains more gas than the entire nation of Canada, who is the major supplier of gas to the United States. So due to the sheer size and the location of the field, Kobikta's development really represents a timely and important opportunity for China and South Korea. And the original proposal of the Kobikta project was to send 20 BCM per year to China and 10 BCM per uh, year going to South Korea. 
Also, I happen to be the first foreigner who uh, visited this field two years ago. What seems to be very important about uh, this project is that uh, they are already producing the gas. So, which means that all of the feasibility study is really complete. And also just because this gas project is the hardest energy project in the world, uh, the project has received so much attention in terms of the pipeline direction. There were numerous changes in terms of the ownership of asset, or so the pipeline direction. Now the Mongolian route was completely ruled out due to the Chinese objection, and also North Korean option was also abandoned due to the high political risk. Also the third development that I want to discuss is uh, the ESPO, the Eastern Siberian Pacific Ocean Oil Pipeline. I also visited the ESPO uh, in Taishet area like two weeks ago. And the most people think that Japan won and the China lost. But uh, actually nobody lost and nobody won. The both Japan and China will receive the oil from the Russia using this pipeline. China is going to receive the 50 million tons of oil every year since the uh, China line from the Skoborodino to Daqing has been just completed. Also, the second line from Skoborodino to Kozmino Terminal in Nahutka area will be completed by the 2015. But I would argue that the oil cooperation between Russia and other A Asian countries is very important. But this is not as important, also it's not as urgent as the gas cooperation in the region. This is partly because the China, Korea, and Japan already have secured the stable oil supply from their uh, traditional Middle Eastern markets. So despite the, some of the efforts made by the Russia and Northeast Asian countries, a number of problems and obstacles are still obstructing the regional energy security cooperation. Whether bilateral or multilateral, the energy security cooperation has been delayed because of a number of reasons. These include the Russia's protectionist energy policy, also Russia's domestic petroleum industry interests, mostly Gazprom's boundless ambition to control all of the gas project within the Russian boundaries, also the lack of government initiatives from the Northeast Asian countries, meaning by mostly the South Korean case, also the lack of mutual trust among the Northeast Asian countries, and also the relative underdevelopment of efficient the energy distribution networks in the region. But other factors, such as the potential pipeline transit country problems, notably the North Korean problem, China-Mongolian relations, also regional rivalry between Russia and China, as well as Russia's unpredictable energy policy towards the foreign companies, also presents obstacles. Let me just briefly talk about a few obstacles for uh, two minutes. As far as the natural gas transfer is concerned, the role of government is crucial. But the government support is still lacking in the region. In fact, the development of gas corporations such as Kobikta and Sahalin project have been affected by the general sluggishness of bilateral diplomatic relations between Russia and other Northeast Asian countries. For example, it is clear that the active government policies in favor of gas are essential for the market penetration of gas. The trans-border ga uh, gas projects in the Russian Far East will not materialize unless they receive the active political support of all states involved. But for example, the South Korean government has not actively enough promoted the use of Russian oil and gas, especially uh, the Kobikta pipeline gas project. Again, the role of the government in the energy diplomacy is really important because the government set the rules and also partly determines the cost and the benefits of uh, uh, economic activities. So state authorized third party access or op open access to essential facilities such as LNG terminals, LNG pipelines, uh, pipelines and also storage allow both suppliers and consumers easier access to the gas market. So although a number of energy agreements were made, 
during the summit between Russia and other Northeast Asian countries. In general, the diplomatic relations have been stagnant and have not facilitated the greater cooperation in energy projects. This partly has to do with the overall Russia's image in the region, I would argue. In most cases, uh, the Russia has been portrayed as a polluting nation or bugbear or unreliable partner to Northeast Asian countries. And Northeast Asian countries tend to be still uh, reluctant to work with Russia on energy matters, even though Russians never cut the gas supply to Western European countries during the Cold War period. Uh, the other problem also is related to the, uh, the energy price issues. The competitiveness of Russia's oil and gas price in the Northeast Asian energy market is also often questioned. The price of gas determines the pace and the time of the development of the gas pipeline and LNG project, as well as the will of the foreign investors. As long as the delivered pipeline or Sahalin LNG gas price is competitive with that of LNG from either Middle East or Southeast Asia, there is a high possibility that Russia's gas supply will be developed. If it is not competitive, the incentive for developing the Russian pipeline gas and LNG will remain low. And the problem is that despite the advantage that Sahalin LNG enjoys in terms of delivery distance and its winter usage potential, there is still doubt that the delivered price of Sahalin gas will be competitive with uh, gas from Yemen, Qatar, Indonesia, Brunei, or Australia. And let me just uh, finish in just one minute. And lastly, unlike the European continent, energy issues are completely turning into zero-sum game in Northeast Asia. So far, there is no indication that countries are really looking at energy issues as a positive-sum game. Although Northeast Asian countries believe that energy projects in the Russian Far East could play a crucial role in integrating the Northeast Asian community and also promoting the regional energy cooperation, at the same time, they also each fear that the access of other Northeast Asian countries to Russian energy supplies will lead to their own exclusion. For example, the Russia is uh, the China is clearly concerned about the possibility of exclusive access by Japan and South Korea to future supplies from Russia, whereas Japan and South Korea have a similar concern about China. In fact, many of the projects under consideration are also oriented to the Chinese market. Russia also worries the fact that if China becomes the monopoly of consumer of Russian energy resources, it will come to dictate the price of Russian energy resources. As for South Korea, it is afraid of possible disruptions in pipeline supplies through the North Korea and China. Perhaps the most important factor that will determine the success of energy cooperation in the region as far as the pipeline scheme is concerned is North Korea. The opening of North Korea is a prerequisite for the realization of a smooth energy collaboration between Russia and South Korea and also between China and South Korea, particularly in terms of a power grid connection and the pipeline project. So in other words, the relationship between Pyongyang and Seoul and Pyongyang and Moscow are the key variables in deciding the pace of a further development of energy cooperation in the region. It is also interesting to point out that Russia is always suspicious of the possible US future intervention in energy cooperation in the region. Russia witnessed uh, throughout the history is that within almost every part of the world, especially where energy issues were strategically important, the US has always played the role of a bugbear who tried to weaken the Russia, Russia's influence, according to the Russians. So Russia's worst nightmare is that the US collaborate with China or other Asian states as a major gas demanding nations and push the Kremlin to lower its gas prices. So this hypothesis cannot be totally overlooked because the US has no alternative 
to importing natural gas from the Russian Far East in the near future because the U.S. has no enough domestic gas supply at the moment. Russia also expressed some concerns toward China most recently when China and the U.S. energy company ExxonMobil, which possessed the Sahalin 1 asset, agreed that China would import the significant amount of oil from the Sahalin 1. And there is also very interesting development as regard to U.S. and Russian energy relations in the Asia Pacific. The U.S. doesn't have to, uh, there is some speculation that the U.S. does not have to rely on the Russia's LNG in Siberia anymore due to the incredibly fast growing potential of shale gas within the U.S. territory. There is a still debate on the commercial competitiveness of shale gas compared with conventional gas. But many ex energy experts actually agree that there is no doubt about the uh, uh, economic potential of gas shale, but Russia is really not pleased with the shale gas development story, whether the US intended to put pressure on Russia or not. So therefore, Russia is doing, rich, doing its best to downgrade the potential of the U.S. shale gas in the glo global energy market. So nonetheless, the uh, shale gas development story will be a very interesting subject in the future in the world energy diplomacy and also the Russian-U.S. relations, since the shale gas could turn out a major instrument for the US and also other Asian countries for negotiating the Russia's PNG, uh, pipeline natural gas or LNG gas price in the next few decades. And I'll just step here. Yeah. Well, okay. thanks. Join me in applause for both of our, these speakers. Uh, we got started late for this panel, but I want to give us a little bit of time for exchange um, with you. So again, if you'll wait till we get a microphone to you, who would like the first question or a comment? Dan, do we have a microphone? Here we go. Dan, it's coming to you. Um, in your, when you've gone to Russia and you've been visiting these sites, I assume you've also talked to Russian uh, policymakers. How, uh, from how do they, how do Russians think about uh, the region in both in strategic terms as well as in terms of energy, energy politics? In other words. Uh, are, are, do Russians have a kind of strategic vision where they're trying to balance out relations between, say, uh, China and Japan and Korea, or uh, do they have some other uh, sort of way in which they see the role of energy furthering their larger foreign policy purposes? Dan, why don't you pass the uh, f microphone straight forward to Mike, and let's put two questions uh, on, on the table simultaneously. Well, <clears throat> this one's directed at David. I guess just two quick questions. One is, you talked on numerous occasions about the post the need to rotate the Chinese economy towards a post-industrial configuration, and I just kept wondering how do you do that in a society that's still over 50 percent rural and has another 400 million people to urbanize? So I'm just not sure how what what post-industrial means in that setting. The other question really is, you said, well, China's got to quit being an exporter, but of course. They're exporting because we're buying, and so those exports are going to, if they are not made in China, presumably going to Bangladesh or Indonesia or somebody else that's not probably going to be all that more respectful in the environment than the Chinese. So where does it get us? So, Ann, why don't you go first? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful question. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that Russia's energy diplomacy toward Northeast Asian countries is really ambiguous. Yeah, um, I don't know whether uh, the Russia's energy diplomacy toward Northeast Asian countries is conducted by really political aims or the commercial aims. But it seems to me clear that the Russia is aware of the fact that the Japan and the South Korea are the world largest LNG uh, consuming or LNG importing country. 
Also, from the South Korean perspective, uh, I don't think Japan wants to, uh, uh, Russia wants to collaborate with Japan uh, to establish the LNG business. So instead, Russia wants the South Korea to really uh, help the, uh, the establishing the LNG uh, industry for, for Russia. Because traditionally, the Russia has been quite strong on the PNG business. But Russia has no knowledge about the LNG business, uh, traditionally. And the South Korea has really uh, one of the best LNG uh, technique and also the infrastructure. So the Russia really wants the South Korea really to help to, uh, to build LNG uh, facility in the Russian Far East. Also, uh, it seems to me that the Russian tactics, the main purpose in Northeast Asia is to really stimulate the fierce competition among the different nations. So uh, I really think this is the Russia's uh, tactic toward Northeast Asia. David? Thank you. Yes, thank you, David, for those two questions. That really helps clarify this issue of structural rotation. There's no question that uh, the demographic transition is a really important component of uh, the overall economic structure. And the, the rural majority, and it is a majority, it's not an agricultural majority anymore, uh, but the rural population is still a majority. Many of that, those people are not engaged in farming, but they still live in areas which are dominated by uh, relatively low income subsistence. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as most of you are aware, China has over 200 cities with more than a million people in them. And uh, you may not be aware that the World Bank, which has been looking at the demographic transition, is now predicting that by 2030, China will move from about 12% of today's middle class to 38% of the world's middle class. And that'll be a very momentous transition. Uh, it'll, it'll ignite. Uh, a new domestic market uh, for goods, which uh, really I don't, I'm not sure that the rest of the world is going to be able to meet alone. I think uh, not only will Chinese producers see new opportunities in their own domestic market, but there'll be a, an intensification of the herd uh, activity that you already see, where um, most other Asian economies have uh, shifted from butting heads with China in third markets like the OECD markets to reorient their exports to the world's most dynamic domestic economy, which is China. They've figured out that it, uh, China is a very effective competitor. It doesn't make sense to compete against China in the OECD, Europe, and the United States. But it makes sense then to basically reorient their exports towards this new emerging domestic economy. And uh, most of the major indicators for consumer goods are showing extremely robust growth in the so-called luxury goods, cosmetics, and uh, and uh, discretionary uh, consumer goods. Let's remember that the definition of middle class is a little more generous um, on a global basis than it is in the West, where we have very high cost of living. The middle class is defined by, uh, by uh, researchers that try to study this as any group that has discretionary income on a daily basis. And that can mean $10 a day. Uh, if you have discretionary income, then that means you're essentially emerging in a new category of consumption beyond your basic needs. And the majority of China's population will reach that status relatively soon. Uh, China's at about $6,500 uh, per capita right now. And uh, I think we'll see it, be, it uh, becoming a kind of a self-sufficient uh, uh, Keynesian-type economy long before the, dem the demographic transition is complete, simply because of the scale of the urban populations. They're big enough. Now, on the issue of exports, I didn't mean to imply, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, that exports uh, from China would be shrinking. When I'm talking about rotation, I mean that the share of exports in total GDP will be shrinking. But I think everybody predicts that China's exports will continue to grow for the foreseeable future, even uh, the most bullish of, uh, of uh, uh, US uh, ITC officials and <laughs> others uh, recognize that China's uh, exports are uh, going to continue to grow. But they may, uh, the domestic market is probably going to grow significantly faster. There's a simple reason for this. The Chinese economy used to be small relative to global markets. It's not anymore. And if China wants to continue to grow at 6 to 8%, they can't rely on OECD economies to provide that, that demand growth. Because those, this is the old world, folks. We grow at 2 to 3% per year. 
And when China was small relative to our markets, they could expand and grow by expanding market share. They can't do that any longer. They're large relative to those destinations now, and so they're going to have to increasingly rely on their own demand in order to sustain growth. And we all know that uh, over the last generation, one of the absolutely most defining characteristics of economic transition was really a political transition. That is, the Communist Party basically transformed its legitimacy from ideology to economic growth. I mean, the criteria for that legitimacy. They've got to sustain these growth rates. And the domestic economy is really the only place in the global economy to do it, because China is one of the few really bright spots in terms of growth. And you can expect to see the government trying to promote more and more of that internal process, even with the painful recognition that the currency appreciation will have to be part of that story. OK, let's see if we can squeeze in one or two more questions, if we got any. Anyone? People are getting Looks tired. like people uh, want to go down to the reception. Uh, uh, well, then I will. Uh, bring these proceedings to um, a close. Um, it's been a, I found it a very rich day. Um, and I want to thank you all for allowing NBR and the Wilson Center to highlight um, the new National Asia Research Program. Five of the speakers here today were uh, NARP fellows or associates. Um, we will be publishing, we being NBR and the Wilson Center, uh, we'll, we'll be publishing papers by the associates and um, the fellows in a variety of venues in the weeks and months to come. Um, some papers will appear in book form, others uh, in the Asia uh, policy Journal, still others in other types of publications that um, NBR and the Wilson Center will put together. So I hope you will consider this simply as an early step uh, in your uh, uh, growing familiarity with uh, the National Association Research Program. Um, we, as you've heard, have a class of 39 associates and fellows. Um, for two-year appointments. Um, in the second half of next year, 2011, we will begin the process of seeking nominations for a new class. Uh, I would hope that perhaps some of you would either nominate yourselves or uh, suggest others for nomination. Uh, we would simply encourage you to keep uh, your ears and your eyes open. We'll be sending out um, word when the nomination process begins. Uh, but I think this uh, whole mechanism is really a splendid way for encouraging what we, and I think you in this room, believe is very important, which is to create new ways for this scholarly community to talk to the policymaking community and vice versa. Uh, it has been the feeling of many of us uh, who have had foots and feet in each camp uh, that there's simply not enough dialogue and exchange between those two communities to the detriment of each. Uh, and so this program today has been one modest step uh, in trying to enhance and promote that collaboration and that communication, and there'll be plenty of others, um, culminating or not culminating, but uh, certainly leading up to our national convention, uh, which we call the Asia Policy Assembly, which will be held in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 2012. So I certainly hope we'll see many of you uh, there for that. Uh, lots of people to thank. Um, First of all, uh, our host, the Institute for East Asia Studies, uh, and particularly uh, Wen Shen Ye. Uh, it's been a marvelous experience in good measure because of you and your staff, uh, and we thank you very much, and we hope you'll invite us back uh, to do this again. I uh, also need to single out and take pleasure in singling out um, other sponsors, the Center for Global Partnership, uh, and particularly the Asia Foundation. Uh, I think it was mentioned this morning that Doug B. Ryder is uh, retiring again uh, as president of the Asia Foundation uh, a little bit later this year. Uh, Doug uh, 
on behalf of all of us, we wish you and Louise a uh, wonderful uh, retirement again, though indeed uh, we don't want you to completely retire, and I know that you will remain engaged in the discussion of public policy issues. Um, but warm thanks for your sponsorship, and as you said, this in fact was your idea, uh, so I'm delighted that we were able to work together to implement that. Uh, he's not here now, but obviously we want to thank uh, Bob Scalapino for allowing us the great privilege and honor of honoring him. Um, and that gets us, of course, to Mike Lampton, uh, the first uh, uh, winner of the Scalapino Award. Uh, Mike, you got us off to a great start this morning, and thank you for your comments. Uh, and similarly, thanks to all the presenters. I think all of them did a variety of, uh, uh, in a variety of ways, um, did a marvelous job. Um, we thank them. We thank those of you on the other side of this table uh, who were there. Uh, my co-conspirator, uh, the list goes on and on, but I do recognize that you want to get to the reception, so I won't go on forever. But uh, my co-conspirator sitting in the very back of the room, Rich Ellings, um, who is the president of NBR and who I think can accurately and honestly be described as the real uh, moving force behind the creation of the National Asia Research uh, program. Uh, Michael Wills, uh, Melissa, um, uh, who did much of the work on this particular program, uh, thanks for them. I don't think TJ Pimpel is here now, but, but TJ was uh, particularly uh, helpful as well. Um, others, uh, I don't think she's here either, but uh, will you please tell Coverly that we appreciate uh, her good work as well. Uh, and now, um, if you would join me in one last round of applause for all our speakers. <laughs> and if you will also join me downstairs for a reception. We are now adjourned. <laughs>